Uh, it's my great, great pleasure today to introduce Professor Nobuyuki Hanaki. Nobi is a professor of economics at the Institute of Social and Economic Research at Osaka University. He's also the director of the Research Center for Behavioral Economics. Since his graduation from Columbia University in the US, he has worked in many universities around the world, mainly in Europe uh, and mainly in France, which is also, I think, where I first met you, Nobi. So his Thank professional you. career has, in some sense, spanned many continents. And I'm sure he has contributed in all these continents as well. And um, Osaka University, I'm sure, benefits from the experiences that he brings. His research has appeared in many um, important and uh, respected economics journals, uh, such as e Economic Journal, Management Science, European Economic Review, uh, Journal of Economic Behavior and Organization, and Journal of Economic Dynamics and Control. He works on many diverse topics. Uh, his work ranges from bubbles in financial markets to Nash bargaining concepts. Um, one of the unifying theme of his work, at least for me, is that uh, all his experiments are very well grounded uh, in theory. And I think today's talk might be a good example of that. He's going to be talking about an experiment on the NASH program. Um, please join me in welcoming Nobi for the plenary session today. Okay, thank you, Lata. Uh, so let me start sharing the screen first. All right, oh, thank you, Lata, for that uh, very nice introduction. Thank you everybody for being with us uh, this morning and thank you organizer for giving me wonderful opportunity to present my work in progress. So today I will be talking about my experiment on the NASH program. And this is a joint work with my uh, two former colleagues from France, uh, Michela Cessa and Emile Claudio. Uh, so I, be, I spent 10 years in France you know, out of my career. So this kind of uh, grew up from my uh, past, uh, my, my time down there. And also with Takashi Yamada, who is a long time uh, friend of mine. So, uh, you know, uh, attending uh, this type of international conferences, uh, you notice that uh, often Americans and the European researchers start their presentations with a joke, while uh, Japanese researchers tend to start their presentation with an apology by saying that, I'm sorry that my English is not perfect. And I thought of following this tradition of uh, Japanese researchers, but I realized myself to be too internationalized to become real Japanese. So let me start my presentation with a research question. Okay. So in this paper, uh, we ask these uh, questions. So which of the two non-cooperative bargaining mechanism, uh, Winter 94 economic theory, or Hart and Maskolel uh, 96 econometrica, uh, resulting allocation according to Shapley bargain in expectation as predicted by the theory. And also we go, for, we go a little bit further by asking which of these two mechanisms better satisfy the action that characterize that paper. And I think most of the, most of the audience that uh, are here today, maybe this is too abstract. So let me try to motivate why we ask uh, this, these questions by giving you a little bit a bigger picture. Okay. So uh, Brandenburger and Neobov uh, popularized an idea of co-opetition. Uh, in their 1996 book of the same title. The co-opetition uh, referred to an act of competitors cooperating in order to achieve a common goal. So if you think a bit about it, uh, it's common and it is basically everywhere. So for example, us researchers who compete in order to find something new, uh, decide to collaborate and start joint research project. And this is at a small scale, but the companies also form alliances. For example, Nissan, Renault, and Mitsubishi form the three company alliance uh, in order to achieve a higher profit. Uh, municipalities in various countries uh, form a union to save the cost on providing some public, large public facilities. And countries also sign multilateral international agreements to achieve the common goal, for example, to fight against climate change. Right? And all this problem involves uh, multiple parties joining and deciding how to allocate the cost and benefit of uh, joint reacting. And once that achievement, uh, once agreement is made, then they decide to act in each other. And into, in deciding whether to 
join the alliance or not, each involved party would consider what would be the gain from cooperating uh, and by joining the alliance. At the same time, they would also consider what would be the gain from not joining the alliance and, and in that uh, the various outside options. So these uh, complex uh, thought get into the process of forming alliance and agreeing on how to allocate the cost and benefit. So just to give you an example of a bit, again, this is a bit abstract example, but consider three companies, uh, one, two, and three. If you want real names, you can think of it as a Nissan, Luno, and Mitsubishi, all those numbers are totally made up. So don't, don't think of it as a real example. But the, suppose the net profit of these companies can generate by acting alone or together uh, as shown in this table. For example, the company one, company two can generate 20 million uh, US dollar profit if they act alone, while company three can generate 30 million US dollar as a profit. But if they, three of us, three of them uh, cooperate and act together, they can jointly generate 100 million. And they can also form a coalition uh, only among the two of them, like one and two can generate 45 million US dollar profit by joint reacting, and which is greater than the sum of the profit they can generate by acting alone, et cetera. If these informations are there, then the question is how do these three companies share the profit? They can jointly generate this one, 100 million, so that uh, they agree on forming an alliance. And this problem uh, is not new, in fact. This problem has been analyzed extensively, at least theoretically. And there are, in broadly speaking, there are two uh, strands of literature. One is called cooperative game theory, and another is called non-cooperative game theory. And the cooperative game theory, uh, in this strand of literature, researchers do not consider any specific bargaining process. And instead they look for allocations that satisfy the set of desirable properties that they call actions. And one of the such uh, allocation or one of the solution that which is well known is Shapley value that we consider in our paper. And we're gonna, I'm gonna explain to you a little bit more about Shapley value in the following slide. The non-cooperative game theory, which you are all familiar with, is that in this trend of literature, uh, literature researcher analyze the equilibrium outcome of a specific bargaining process or the mechanism among the strategic players. Okay. The NASH the, and the winter mechanism and the heart and mass flow mechanism that we consider in this paper belong to this uh, type of the theoretical analysis. The NASH program is the research program that tries to bridge these two strands of the uh, theoretical analysis. The aim is to show a cooperative event solution as an equilibrium outcome of plausible bargaining process. And you know, there's a wealth of uh, theoretical literature on this research program, but surprisingly, not much experimental investigation has been done until now. And what we want to do in this particular paper is try to contribute to this strand of the literature. Okay. And this is why we ask these uh, questions. Uh, which of the two non-cooperative bargaining mechanism, winter or hot and mask oil, without any allocation according to Shapley value? This is exactly in line of what the NAS program, uh, the research in NAS program has been doing, theoretically, but we want to do it experimentally. And then uh, instead of uh, just not just by looking at allocation, but we also want to do a bit further by asking which of the two mechanisms better satisfy the action that characterize the Shapley value. Okay, now having uh, given you some a big, uh, bigger motivation, let me get into the specificity of uh, these uh, questions. So let me start with uh, Shapley value. Okay, the Shapley value, as I, ha I have already said, is a solution concept in a cooperative game theory, and it awards each player the average of her marginal contribution to each coalition. And it's that so by considering that all the orders of coalition formation are equally likely. And it's best seen by uh, looking at the example. So let's take the three, three players game that I have shown you before, okay? And there are six possible ordering of arrival of the players. The player one arrives first and player two arrives second and player three arrive in the last in forming the coalition. Or it can be the case that the player two arrives first and then one and three, et cetera. So let's take the case of player one, okay? And player one's 
marginal contribution when he's the first one to arrive. So there was nobody before, and he's the first one to arrive. And then he's bringing in his individual value to the project, which is 20. Okay? And there are two possible ordering in which he is the first one to arrive. So this is his marginal contribution. It is possible that he is the second to arrive and a country, uh, form a coalition with player two. So player two was already there and player one joined and form a coalition. So in this case, value of the coalition between one and two are 45. And given that player two's value was already 20, the marginal contribution that player one bring into this coalition is 25. Similarly, he can join the uh, coalition uh, one and three uh, by coming after player three. Okay, so one and three can jointly generate 55 while player three's individual value is 30. Again, the marginal contribution player one is 25. And finally, he can be the last one to arrive and join the coalition two and three to form what we call grand coalition, a coalition by everybody. In this case, the marginal contribution he brings in is difference, difference between 100 and 60, which is 40. And there are two possible ordering in which he will be the last one to align, okay? So the Chapelet value simply takes the average of all the six possible marginal contribution and that results in 2833. Okay. So you can do the same for player two and player three to arrive at these values. Okay. So this is uh, the way the Chapelet value is computed and in the cooperative game framework. So why do we care about Chapelet value? As I already said, this is a very well-known solution concept in, uh, in the cooperative game theory. If not the most well-known, uh, it is one of the most well-known. And it satisfies some intuitive and desirable properties that I'm gonna show you in the next slide. And in the class of the game, we consider in our experiment for the convex game, it is included in the core, which is uh, yet another very well-known concept uh, in a game theory. So by testing the Chapelet value, we are also jointly testing some aspect of the core, but we are focusing on the Chapelet value. So let me just uh, explain a bit about the convex game. So the convex game is a game in which marginal contribution of the players are non-decreasing in the size of existing coalition. So that example that we showed you before, the marginal contribution of the player one is increasing in the size of the existing coalition. This is the type of the game we are considering. So the bigger the, the, the coalition, the better it is, or the better it is, the bigger the marginal contribution for the player. So that's why uh, that's the type of the game that we want to consider. Okay, and the core I will explain to you in the later slide. Right. So this is a Chapelet value on one hand, and the Chapelet value, as I said, satisfies nice properties. And for example, efficiency, symmetry, and null player, as well as others. So let me explain a little bit about efficiency. This simply means that for every game uh, in the set of the game that we consider, that the sum of the payoff uh, that each player is receiving should be equal to the value that they can jointly generate. So there is no waste. Uh, that's kind of nice and intuitive. Okay. The symmetry uh, property means that if there are two players who are symmetric, uh, the symmetric player means that their marginal contribution to the all the existing coalitions are the same, right? then their payoff should be the same. This is also intuitive and plausible. If their contribution there, identical in the sense of their marginal contribution, why should they receive different pay, right? And finally, the null player property is that if there is a null player and the null player is a player whose marginal contribution is zero for all the possible uh, coalition, then his payoff should be zero, right? And there are others that uh, I'm not gonna elaborate here, but I will elaborate later. And the separate, uh, separate value satisfies all these uh, properties. And this people consider to be a nice and desirable, okay? Right. So there exists a Chapelet value in a cooperative game theory. And then in under the Nash program, theoretical analysis, people came up with uh, various non-cooperative mechanism that implement Chapelet value as an equilibrium outcome. And there are four well-known uh, mechanism, one by Gal, uh, 89 Econometrica, and this is based on the pairwise bargaining, two player get together, bargain, and then uh, the bargaining expand to the other, play, other pair. And the winter we consider, it's based on the demand by each player. So basically the player asking how much they want uh, as they go along. And Hart and Mascarell and Perez Castillo and Wettstein, and they are based both on proposal and the acceptance. So there will be a 
player chosen to make a proposal of the allocation and the remaining player decide to accept that proposal or not. And we're gonna be focusing on these two, but you know, the, it's kind of surprising from an experimental point of view, right? So there are four mechanisms. They all say that they're gonna implement Chaplet value at equilibrium. Then the natural question for an experimenter to ask is, which one uh, better implement? And to our surprise, there is no experimental comparison among these uh, existed uh, prior to our work, okay? And this is why uh, we're gonna start by comparing these two. And then you may ask, why these two to begin with? Why not Gal and why not Perez Castillo? Uh, let me uh, explain why these two. Number one, we consider these two are equally simple. Uh, not only that, I, we think that comparison between demand-based uh, mechanism and offer-based procedure are of, uh, of interest, of our interest in its own. Uh, the namely, uh, there's a difference in terms of required amount of information between the two. And this can be important, not in a particular setup where the information is complete, but in the case where information is not complete. Okay? And this was pointed out by Young in his 98 paper. So just uh, imagine that offer-based mechanism, you, know, you are the one that's making propose, proposal or the allocation. And the proposal need to consider about everybody's acceptable share. Right? What would be the share that the latter would be, it would be acceptable for latter, et cetera. While in case of a demand-based uh, mechanism, when I'm making my own demand, and this is the amount that I want to receive, I just need to consider my own uh, wish or the, my own share, not about everybody else. And this is the demand-based mechanism require much less information compared to the offer-based. So we think it is important to compare what will be the consequence of uh, this difference as well. And another point is that uh, there is a similar comparison existed in the literature. Uh, in 2005, Econometrica, Freshet and his co-author uh, published uh, similar experimental result done in the framework of voting game. So what they did is to compare between offer-based baron fair uh, mechanism and demand-based Morelli's mechanism. And what they found is that despite of the difference in the ex ante as well as ex post theoretical prediction between these two mechanisms, the experimental outcome were similar. Okay. But in our case, uh, these two models at Winter and Hart Moscow had the same ex ante prediction, but the different ex post prediction. So it is not clear whether we're going to get the similar outcome as the first uh, and uh, his co also found. And furthermore, they have considered the experiment in a voting game, and we are considering that in the, demand, uh, the cost and profit allocation game, which has a different, uh, in a different nature. So I think it is also important and interesting to contrast the result from the voting game and what we do in our convex. Okay. Just to give you a summary of what we have found, uh, here's a punchline of the result, experimental result. We found that the offer-based heart and muscular mechanism better induces player to cooperate and to agree on an efficient outcome. On the other hand, the demand-based winter mechanism better implement allocation that reflect player's effective bargaining power that is captured by the Shapley value. So unlike what the theory uh, suggests, the choice of the mechanism not only uh, impact the ex post allocation, but also the ex ante allocation, and which is different from what the Freset found in the uh, Freset and his course are found in their voting. Okay. So, uh, in the remaining uh, time, I will elaborate more on the detail of the uh, theory as well as experimental design as the following. First, I will start uh, giving you some explanation, the further explanation about the winter and the heart and muscle mechanism. After that, I will give you some detail of the experimental procedure and then present you the result and summarize uh, and also give a bit, so, bit of thinking about the future uh, research in this, uh, in this area. Okay. Great. So let me start with the, simplify, uh, the explanation of the winter demand commitment bargaining procedure. So this is a version that we implemented in our experiment. So the player, will be chosen randomly to become the demander. Okay. 
And if the player is uh, chosen as his player is chosen, then he makes a demand, meaning that this is the amount of the point I want. And then points to a next player who makes a demand. So if a group of player can form a coalition, mean uh, they receive their demand and they leave the game. So after each player making their demand, we check whether his demand or the demand by the other player who made a demand prior to them can be satisfied with the value they can jointly generate. Okay. The game, if there are some players whose demand are satisfied and they left the game, the game continues with the remaining player until we reach the last player who makes a demand. And the player who with unsatisfied demand leaves the game with their individual value. So the equilibrium payoff of this game depends on the complete ordering of the player making the demand. But it's implement at the equilibrium, the supply value as the expected payoff. And for this two statement, I think it is better to see an example. So let me show you an example about the uh, subject perfect equilibrium of this uh, procedure. So take the same game, and we do the backward induction. And imagine that demand is made in order of player one, two, and three in this order. At the last step, let's also imagine that one and two remained in the game uh, so that their demand was not satisfied, which means that they demanded more than what they can individually produce. And also their total demand is greater than what, greater than what they could jointly produce. Okay. Now, the minimum player three would demand, well, it is his turn to uh, make a demand, is that. Why? Because if no coalition is formed, the game ends, everybody gets their thing, uh, individual value. So this is a value that he can get without forming any coalition. So he would demand anything above this value. Taking that into account, when player two makes demand, and note that uh, when player two is making demand, player one stays with the demand, which is which he cannot satisfy, which cannot be satisfied his individual value. That two knows that for player three to join a coalition with him to form this coalition two and three, three needs to receive at least thirty, right? So therefore, the minimum the player two demand would be the difference between. The, the value that the player two and three can for, uh, generate by forming a coalition and what player three would demand, which is 30. And this 30 is greater than what player two can generate by herself. Okay. And not further that this 30 is not possible to, uh, for the player two to receive with the coalition one and two, because coalition one and two can generate only a payoff of 45 points, but at the same time, player one is demanding more than 20, which leaves only 25 or less to player two. Okay. Therefore, what player two demand would be that uh, something more than 30 at least. Okay. Then the, the uh, first step, uh, when player one is making his own demand, he knows that for player two and three to join a coalition with uh, her to form this grand coalition, uh, three would need to receive 30 that we have already discussed, and player two needs to receive 30 as well. Therefore, player one would demand the difference between the value of the current coalition 100 minus the, the value of the coalition that uh, player two and three can gen jointly generate, which is 40. So the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium payoff of this particular ordering in this mechanism is that player one demands 40, player two demands 30, and player three demand 30 and everybody is happy, grand coalition is formed and they leave the game. Okay. And this is uh, in the sense that uh, the order, complete ordering of ma player making demand matters for the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium. But at the same time, this ordering of the player can be random, right? So player two can be the first one or player three can be the first one to make the demand, etc. Therefore, on average, if we think that all the possible ordering is equally likely, then the equilibrium outcome on average is going to be the supply value. Okay? And this is a winter procedure we uh, consider. In the full specification of his theoretical analysis, you know, at the end of the first round of everybody making the uh, demand, there is another round. And the player has to pay a small cost to go to the another, another round. And uh, the, what the theory shows that in this particular case, as a, the cost goes to zero, 
And then it reaches the Shapley value as an expected uh, value. But we consider just uh, as a simplification in the experiment, we decide to implement this in a one round uh, negotiation game. Okay. So this is a winter uh, uh, mechanism that we consider. How about heart and mass flow? Uh, this is also very simple in the sense that uh, it starts with a player being randomly chosen to become a proposer. And the proposer makes a proposal for an allocation. And this proposed allocation must be feasible in the sense that the sum of the points allocated to the each person has to be no greater than the value they can jointly generate. And if the other remaining player accepts, the proposal is implemented and the game ends happily. If not, the proposal is removed from the game and received the individual value, and the game continues with the remaining player. Again, uh, the third game perfect Nash equilibrium payoff of this game depend on the order of the proposal, meaning in particular who becomes the first proposal. But because the uh, proposal is chosen at random in the very beginning, it's implement at equilibrium, the Shapley value as expected payoff. Okay, let me just again, uh, go, quickly go through the third game perfect Nash equilibrium of this mechanism. The same game, we do the backward induction as before. And let's assume that first player one is the first proposal as the, and the player one, when he is making proposal, he kind of anticipated if the proposal is rejected, there will be two players remain with their joint value being 60. And among these two players, they are going to uh, divide the uh, pie. If the responder rejects the proposal at this stage, at this stage meaning that the player two and three remains, they each get his individual value, right? A 20 or 30 here. So expecting this, the proposal keeps the surplus, meaning that if proposal is player two, player two in this stage, uh, two can receive 30 and give a uh, player three 30. This is the individual value and he basically, player two keeps the surplus. If the proposal is player three, then player, sorry, player three offer player two get his individual value and player three try to keep the, the surplus, uh, which is so 40. And since these two are equally likely because the proposal is randomly chosen, two can expect to receive 25 points and three can expect to uh, receive 35 points by reaching this state. And when player one making his proposal, take this into account. And therefore player one, uh, when he makes an uh, offer, he will give 25 to player two and 35 to uh, player three and keeps a surplus. And also this is going to be the subgame perfect Nash uh, equilibrium payoff. So this is a heart and mass flow uh, procedure. And again, this is a simplified version in the sense that in a full version, when the proposal is rejected, the proposal can be removed from the game with positive probability, but not necessarily B1. So we implemented the extreme version in which if the proposal is rejected, the uh, proposal will be rejected with probability one, but the theory allows this probability to be less than one, but strictly uh, greater than zero. And, but it does not change the theoretical prediction. Right. So just to summarize the theoretical uh, analysis, this is the uh, this picture basically contains all the solutions that I have already discussed. So this triangle summarizes the set of all possible allocation among three players, dividing 100. And this point shows that player one is taking all the points. Player two is taking all the 100 points and player three is taking all the 100 points. The height in this direction represent how much point player one received. In this direction represent how much player two received. And this direction shows how much player three receives. Okay. And this triangle here, purple, represent what we call imputation set. And this is the set of payoff that guarantees that each player receives at least his individual value. So player one is receiving at least 20, player two is receiving at least 20, player three is receiving at least 30. So this is a set. And the core that I, I already mentioned, this is the another uh, well, very well-known solution, is a set of pair which are coalitionally rational in a sense that it's guarantee that each possible coalition, these three coalition, to receive their coalitional value. For to guarantee the coalitional value of 60 to player two and three, 
player one cannot receive more than 40. So the set is below here, etc. So this is the representation of the code. And as I said, third Shapley value, which is represented in the square, is in the core, and in fact, it is in the center of the core in this particular game and the class of the game that we consider. Winter one, there are six points, and this is because there are six possible ordering in this three player game. And the heart and mask rail, uh, there are three points because it depends on who becomes the first proposal. And on average, it coincides on the supply value. Okay. So this is a theory, and we want to test whether these two mechanisms indeed generate supply value as an expected payoff uh, as predicted by theory. If not, what will be the deviation? So these are the four games that we consider. So instead of considering three player game, we decided to do four player game. And the reason is that in order to test all the axioms that we want to test, we couldn't do, we couldn't come up with a set of three player games to do so. And although this became a little bit more complex as a game, this was the only way that we thought uh, we could. And there are four games. And in game one, player two and three are symmetric, uh, meaning that their marginal contribution are the same for all the possible coalition. In game two, player one is a null player, meaning that his marginal contribution is zero for all the possible coalition. And it's, it's best seen by comparing this one. So the value of uh, coalition two, three, four is the same as value of the grand coalition. So the player one cannot contribute anything in addition to three players coalition. But uh, if you look at the payoff, uh, which is difficult to see in the slide, uh, take my word, that the marginal contribution of player one to all the possible coalition is zero. Okay. And play, uh, games three and four are simply uh, the combination of these two games. So game three is the sum of uh, game one and game two. And game four is simply the multiplication of the game one. And the reason that we want to do this is to test for additivity, homogeneity, strong monotonicity, and fairness action that characterizes the Shapley value as well. Okay. And this is a game that we consider. Okay, so let me explain you a little bit about the procedure. So each participant plays all the four games in our experiment. Okay. And each game is repeated twice. So there will be eight play of the game. And this is a choice we made consciously. The alternative would be that in each session, the player plays only one game. Okay. But we didn't do so because uh, in order to test our axiom, we need the combination of the all the games. And we thought it is better to have some within subject variation in order to have a better control of the subject, uh, subject characteristic variation. Again, but uh, we haven't uh, tested whether this was a better way of doing so or not, but this is a choice we made. And all of the games are one of the following, which varies across a session. And in some session, the uh, smaller games are done first. And in another session, the larger game, meaning that uh, the ground uh, the payoff for the grand coalition is 200 is now fast okay and there's a random rematching and random reassignment of the role after each round again this is a choice we made and the reason is that uh, in one of our games there's null player and i have done an experiment on a weighted majority voting game in like 10 years ago where the player's role where the player's role was fixed and there is a null player and in that experiment that participant who was assigned in the role of the null player became really, really angry. You know, his face was red during the experiment and he, we, we saw that he was suffering. And we thought, okay, it's not very ethical to do uh, this type of experiment anymore. So we decided to the random rematch. Again, this comes with the cost of player not maybe familiarizing with their role uh, perfectly as we have done in a fixed role. And as a payment, we're gonna choose two rounds, one round from the first two games, uh, or another land from the last two games. And we're gonna pay them according to the point they received in those two games. And these two games differ in terms of the uh, total payoff up across the four groups. In one game, it is 100, another game it's 200. An experiment was done before the COVID, uh, thanks free, and in 2019 at Osaka. The average time payment and number of participants were as follows. The winter, it took longer. Uh, this is because in a winter, ex uh, procedure, four players have to make demand okay, in each uh, player of the game. In Heart and Masquerel, if the first proposal is accepted, then that game, the game ends. This is the reason why it's shorter. And the average payoff was a little bit higher in Heart and Masquerel for the reason that I will explain to you in the result. Okay. All right, so 
let me move into the result. Okay, so here is the uh, first result. This is a frequency of grand coalition formation. The play, four players getting, to, getting together and forming uh, the coalition. In heart and muscle, here's a game one and the winter. So the, the height is the height, height of the bar is the average frequency, and the error bar represents a, a plus minus one standard error. Okay. And game one, game two, well, there's no grand coalition formed in the winter, but this is because there's a null player. So we allowed uh, three player coalition, player uh, forming two, three, four as a uh, grand coalition because it's also generate the same value as the uh, grand coalition. In that case, the winter, uh, the frequency of this uh, extended grand coalition uh, is higher in the winter, but this no, the, there's no statistically significant difference between the two. If we look at game three and game four, you clearly see that the grand coalition was free, much more frequently and significantly so uh, formed under the heart and muscle than the winter. And this is true. So this is result number one. The grand coalition is more likely to be formed under the heart and muscle under, than under the winter. And the consequence of this is the efficiency. So we define efficiency as the share of the total payoff obtained by the four player uh, to the uh, value of the grand coalition. In game one and game two, as we show that there is no significant difference in terms of frequency of grand coalition formation. And as, uh, consequently, there was no significant difference in terms of efficiency. But in game three and game four, the efficiency was significantly higher under the heart and muscle compared to the winter. And this was true also for the game. Okay. But both mechanisms failed to achieve the full efficiency. Uh, you know, remember, this was part of the axiom or the property of the shuttle. Bar. And based on these two results, we, you know, this, uh, we can state that heart and muscle mechanism induces or uh, better induces player to cooperate and achieve efficient allocation than the winter, as I have already stated as one of the key results from this exercise. Okay. Let me move into uh, a bit more detailed analysis. And for the remaining analysis, what we're gonna do is to focus our attention to those groups that formed grand coalition. And the reason is that we want to investigate the property of the Shapley value and the Shapley value, the one of the big properties is efficiency. So we want to focus on those groups who achieved efficient allocation. And we are going to investigate whether ex ante payoff is equal to the Shapley value and whether the various axioms are satisfied. And if I have time, I can also talk about ex post payoff. And the set of analysis I'm gonna to present to you are based, uh, is based on us running a set of following uh, linear uh, regressions. So each regression corresponds to the payoff the player one or player I received in for games. So these are game dummies, and this is the payoff that player I receives. So this set of linear regression, if we run this, the estimated coefficient tell us the average payoff player one received in each game. And we're gonna use this in order to do various statistical analysis. Okay, at this point, I would also want to mention that the result I present to you qualitatively uh, will be the same if we use the payoff share based on the other groups, instead of focusing on the those groups who form the grand coalition and using the realized pair. Okay. Now, here's the figure on the average payoff. So the height is the average payoff of each player in each mechanism and in each game. Okay. The horizontal lines are payoff predicted by the sharp play value. Okay. What you can see, is that, and these stars represent that average payoff obtained from this regression is significantly different from the one that predicted by the sharp level. What you can see is that in game one, game three, game four, and in game two, game two, in all the games, if we look at the heart and muscle, there is no game in which that the average payoff that the player obtained by the average payoff all the player obtained is the same as the sharp level. On the contrary, for the winter, game one, the average payoff is not significantly different from the Shapley value in none of uh, the player. Game three, the same, and game four, it is the same. Right? So average payoff is equal to the Shapley value in the winter for the game, except for game two. And furthermore, that the null player property 
meaning that the player one should get zero. It's satisfied in winter, but in, not in a hot atmosphere. Right? So that's result number one. And result, uh, let me elaborate a little bit more about this one. So if we compute the distance between the average a payoff of each player from the one that's predicted by the Shapley value. We see that although uh, the difference are not big in game one and game four, you can see the big difference in terms of the distance of the realized average uh, payoff from the Shapley value in game two and game three. Namely, that Hart and Masquerel are far away, further away from the Shapley value than the winter, and significant, significantly so when the supply values payoff are more unequal uh, among across the four players. Okay. And finally, let me talk about tax, uh, axioms. So we use this four regression and the symmetry implies that I and J are symmetric in game one and game four. So which implies that the estimated coefficient B1 and C1 and B4 and C4 are the same. And you can do the similar test using the combination of the estimated parameter of this linear regression to test symmetry, additivity and homogeneity, strong monotonicity, and fairness. I'm sorry that I see that my time is uh, not very not enough to explain all of them, but uh, this is the, the way we test the axiom. And here is the result. The and heart and Masquerel, on the axiom that sat is we deem to be satisfied is a homogeneity and everything else fails. In the winter, all the uh, axioms are satisfied. So based on this uh, result about distance from the Shapley value and also the, uh, whether the axiom being satisfied or not, we can state that winter mechanism generates an allocation that better, uh, better represents players' uh, bargaining power as captured by the Shapley value. And this is provided the grand coalition is formed, but a similar qualitative outcome can be made by looking at the payoff share and looking at all the uh, groups, right? Uh, let me skip this. And if I have time, I can come back. So what we did in our paper that we asked the following research question, which of the two non-cooperative bargaining mechanism, demand-based winter or offer-based heart and mass coil, better implement Shapley value. And we did so by experimental comparison with four four player convex game. And the main result coming from our experiment is that choice of the mechanism influences the ex ante outcome. I didn't talk about ex post, but uh, if I have time, I will go back. The offer based heart and muscle mechanism better induces player to cooperate and to agree on an efficient outcome. The demand based winter mechanism better implement allocations that reflect players' effective bargaining power. And as I have already said, the similar conclusion can be allowed based on the looking at payoff share and include all the groups. Okay. And this suggests that, uh, you know, this, this, there's a contrast between what Freshet found in the weighted majority voting game and what we found in the uh, uh, cost allocation game or the payoff profit allocation game. And this also suggests that there's a need more experimental investigation in line with the Nash program or that bridging between the cooperative and non-cooperative uh, game theory. Okay, some of the ongoing and the future research uh, follows. For example, what does the how does the result of winter change if we allow for more repetition with a cost? This was the full specification of uh, winter's mechanism. We already know that there was not much difference between the one round or the two round experiment with high or low cost. This we have already done so. We haven't written the paper yet, but we know the result. How about the other two mechanisms about the Gal and Perez Castillo and Weststein? We have done this experiment. We already know that uh, Perez Castillo and Weststein, because of the complexity that induces in order to determine the proposal in this procedure, performs much worse than the Hart and Masquerel in terms of efficiency, grand coalition formation, etc. And the one that I think uh, many people would ask is that what would be the outcome if we do this experiment in a non-cooperative and the cooperative way, meaning that there is no structure at all in the bargaining process. We have just started doing so, uh, doing this experiment due to the COVID, we couldn't uh, done it before, but we have some results already for some of the experiments. So if you are interested, we can talk about it in the Q&A time. And another uh, point would be, how does the result of heart and muscle change if 
the rejected proposal can stay in a game with probability uh, greater than zero, but less than uh, one. Okay. And if the proposal can be accepted by a part of the remaining player, and these are not uh, considered, we haven't done the experiment at all, but can be interesting in order to really understand the difference between offer-based and demand-based bargaining mechanism. Because we decided on the heart and muscular and winter because there is a theoretical basis, but we can expand our attention to something a bit larger. So uh, let me uh, stop here. And these people helped us running experiment. These institutions gave us the money. And thank you very much, all of you, for listening to my presentation. Okay. Thank you, Nobi. That was a very interesting talk. Um, and we have some time for questions. That's great. So you have kept time very nicely. Does Thank the you. audience have any comments or suggestions or questions? There's a Jose raising hand. Well, since no one's no one else has raised their hand, I'll uh, just make a comment. I really like the idea of uh, comparing these these mechanisms to the unstructured bargaining because um, the the unstructured bargaining is a lot closer to um, I guess the setting that these solution, the Shapley value and so on, were supposed to supposed to cover. So seeing if if implementing the mechanism changes results compared to just the straight unstructured bargaining was a really important uh, 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 thing to check. Right. In fact, I saw that Nick has done the paper on the Nash bargaining on the unstructured bargaining right before. <laughs> yeah, that was only <laughs> that was only two I was player inspired bargaining. By that paper as well. <laughs> Yeah. So we, we only, uh, we only maybe after two. taking two questions that uh, already raised a hand, if we have time, I can show you some of the results I have already on the unstructured bargaining. Jose, you, that, uh, you had raised your. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, okay. So thank you for the presentation. That was extremely interesting. And so I have first a simple question: Why uh, do you have any? Uh, explanation for why the full efficiency result is not uh, is not achieved. Uh, some sort of um, uh, uh, let's say um, maybe it's a learning issue or something. Although the games are informationally relatively simple, uh, do you have some speculation there? And my second question is: uh, so this one is uh, maybe off topic. So ans do not answer if you don't uh, want. But I was thinking about the Rubinstein and Walensky type uh, processes. So is the experimental literature equally silent with respect to this uh, uh, to this mechanism uh, as for the hard and the uh, and the winter uh, uh, processes? And and if it is not, uh, can you tell me something something uh, about the results there? So those are my questions. Okay, so let me start with efficiency. So in, uh, we have checked the. Uh, the efficiency and gun coalition formation in the first half of the game, the fall round, and second half of the game, the fall round. And we see that there is an increase in the efficiency and the frequency of gun coalition formation. So there is a learning issue, and that came with the cost of us implementing in a within subject fashion. So it is possible that if we do this experiment, uh, repeat this experiment much longer, then the frequency of gun coalition formation goes up. And in terms of winter being fading more frequently, this is partly because uh, players are demanding too much. The size of the demand exceeds the value of the grand coalition. While in a uh, heart and mass corridor, because there is a uh, constraint about the proposal the proposal can make, and this over allocation, over demand doesn't happen. And this is a reason uh, there's a difference. In terms of uh, Rubenstein, uh, Wojnski, uh, these two players bargaining process and Nash bargaining, uh, I have to be honest that I haven't looked into the literature, but there has been a quite a bit of experiment on the two-player bargaining, including the Arbachi and Feltovich paper that I mentioned uh, on the unstructured way. And the structured one, uh, uh, I cannot think in top of my head, but I would imagine that uh, there are not quite a bit. Uh, but you know, I will search for it and I get back to you. And sorry for the non-conclusive answer for the second question. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you very much. Katya, you have a question? Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you for a very interesting presentation. So I have 
two questions. So one is on, on the information structure. From what you described, it sounds like under the demand mechanism, you know, the whole sequence of people who's going to be making the demands, whereas under the offer mechanism, you only know the first person to make the offer and the rest of it, you take the expectation over what could happen later. So maybe this, this difference in information structure makes a difference on behavior. That's the first question. And the other one on just measuring efficiency, did you look at the gross efficiency or did you normalize it by uh, taking out the values of individual uh, players coalitions? Because you could think, you know, by default, everyone could walk away just with their own values. So sometimes it makes sense to subtract that from both top and the bottom to get a better feeling of how much better the mechanism is doing as compared to no agreement benchmark. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me start with a first, uh, second question. Uh, I have looked in at the gross, gross efficiency that I presented. So I haven't uh, looked into the net uh, efficiency, which I will do uh, after this uh, talk. So it's a very good idea. And thank you very much for the suggestion. Uh, for the first question about information structure, so the theoretically, uh, yes, there, there is a difference between what matters is the complete order in both as the first uh, proposal. In the experiment, uh, not sure how much of that was really affecting our result uh, because it is possible that even in a proposal based mechanism they uh, reject the first proposal and go to the next one mm -hmm. right and then they know that who became the second proposal so in terms of ex post uh, realized allocation there is uh, always the fast mover or the earlier mover advantage so their payoff should go higher and that's we see somewhat in our paper uh, or less less so in the heart and muscle but we see this this tendency. Uh, in terms of ex-ante, that uh, the ex-ante procedure that I've been focusing on, uh, this is not really uh, uh, an important point, I guess. Okay, thank you. I just thought that if you don't know the complete sequence in advance, you can't really do backward induction, right? The way you described it. So it sounds like under one mechanism you can, under the second, one, you should be doing backward induction under all possible sequences, right? And then taking the average. Uh, true, true, right? But the, okay, so the, it's a theoretical part. So in a demand-based one as well. So uh, when player one is making his demand, he does not know who become the first, uh, uh, the second uh, proposal. At least, although he can point to, but he cannot point to the, oh. Six, okay. subsequent one. So there, the information structure is also there is uncertainty about who will follow in, in what order. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. We have perhaps time for one more question. I actually had a question about your work, to uh, Nobi. So, so. Uh, what I found interesting is that um, the demand-based mechanism supports the axioms better, but you have lower efficiency in that mechanism, in the winter mechanism, right? So one of the things I was thinking about is how do you reconcile these two aspects? And also in the offer-based mechanism, it seems to me as if there would be more behavioral considerations that can come in. So because people are thinking about the offers that would be also, uh, you know, done by by the other players. So there's more more pro-social or anti-social kind of preferences that can come in. And I wondered whether uh, you or the literature looks at some of these aspects. Okay. So uh, all right. So so the discrepancy between the efficiency and action. Uh, so I have to say that uh, the the result on the action I presented is based on only on those groups that form the grand coalition, which means that they achieved efficient allocation. By focusing that, uh, we could uh, look, we could see that uh, action was a better satisfied. And action are basically related to the bargaining power, and that's the reason. Uh, but if we look at uh, 
as a payoff share. But this is also cheating because in a sense that we are normalizing the payoff to be an efficiency. So we get similar results. But uh, again, there is a trade-off between the bargaining power versus efficiency. And related to the second question about uh, offer-based one has more behavioral consideration. And indeed, it is a case that, uh, sorry, let me, so this is the exposed uh, payoff. So as you can see that the uh, heart and mass prayer, so this is, this is the distance between the equal division, equal division, and the distance from the subgame perfect mass equilibrium. The big result coming out of uh, this picture is that heart and mass prayer, the pay allocated payoff are much more equal compared to the winter. So there is this uh, inequality aversion consideration operating more strongly in heart and mass grill. But the, my take on this is a little bit different in the sense that in the heart and mass grill, the proposer, if his re proposal is rejected, he will be kicked out with his individual value. In order to avoid his proposal being rejected, he tend to offer something more equal to everybody. Uh, compared to the winter, because winter one that you simply demand without really considering about that, what the other are asking, right? So- Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank so you. I think, yeah, I think this result is coming from the threat of, of our being rejected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I found that interesting actually, yes. Yeah, that's very good. I think it is really interesting. And uh, this mm -hmm. relate, to, relate, relate to the Nash bargaining experiment versus with meta bargaining type of experiment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's time for us uh, to close the session. Uh, but uh, please join me all in thanking Nobi for a very interesting, very clear, um, and very um, inspiring presentation. There are lots of areas that people can work on in future. There are many extensions that one can do in this particular area. Uh, and bargaining is something that we see in many different aspects of life. Uh, so it can be applied in many different areas. So thank you very much, Nobi. Thank you very much for everyone. Thank you. Bye bye, and uh, see bye you bye. on the other sessions. <laughs> yes, enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye. Bye. bye.